If you would have told me at the beginning of my high-tech career many years ago that someday my doorbell would know the sound of my own voice, I might not have believed you. But today, it's a reality. And guess what? You can design one today. But maybe you aren't a machine learning expert. Maybe you know about the tiny edge and all the cool stuff you can design on it, but you aren't sure where to start. Well, I've got you covered, my friends. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Machine learning at the tiny edge is the way of the future. But how we incorporate machine learning into our designs can take a variety of different forms. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Dan Kozen from Silicon Labs and I chat about how you can add machine learning to your next design. We investigate what machine learning workflows look like, what machine learning tools you can utilize, and the key challenges you will encounter as a machine learning developer. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Silicon Labs. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for inviting me. So, Amelia, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about machine learning. So we all hear of artificial intelligence and machine learning as two terms commonly used in similar context. And the intelligence is being implemented all up and down the stack. Most commonly, we hear of artificial intelligence being implemented in the cloud where smart things happen, like natural language processing or medical image analysis or even credit card fraud. Where Silicon Labs fits specifically, I'm going to explicitly say it's machine learning at the tiny edge. So Dan, what is the tiny edge and why is machine learning there? So what's happening is the intelligence is being pushed down closer to the actual source of the data. That's the tiny edge the very, very bottom of this diagram. It's at the end point. It's the light switch. It's the video doorbell. It's the cold chain monitor. It's the wind turbine sensor. You want to apply your analysis with machine learning right at the data source. Instead of sending that data to the cloud, it's much, much more efficient if you can analyze the data right at the source. Once you're processing at the source, the benefits multiply. Reducing latency, conserving bandwidth, improving privacy, and even reducing costs are just some of the advantages. Plus, you deliver a smarter application. With these advantages, it's no wonder the projections for devices running machine learning at the tiny edge are growing from a half billion to two billion devices in just the next four years. So, Dan, what are some applications at the tiny edge? Machine learning is really a horizontal technology applicable across a wide variety of applications and market segments. It's helpful to describe these applications in the order of increasing chip resource requirements. When looking at an application, the amount of chip resources will increase primarily driven by the data throughput and the complexity of the analysis. On the leftmost column here are applications based on the simplest type of sensors, like accelerometers, temperature and pressure sensors. The applications can be ones like preventative maintenance, health analysis through wearables, or even fall detection. Next are applications using a mic for non-voice audio pattern matching. Applications can be glass break detection, shot detection, machine malfunction, or even breath monitoring. Then the complexity increases when you detect voice or spoken words, especially if detecting in a noisy environment or at a greater distance. Applications here can be voice command smart home devices or wake words for voice assistants like Alexa or Siri. And finally, video input is at the higher end, both in data rate and complexity. As the camera resolution and frame rate increases, so does the processing requirements. Some low-end vision applications can be object recognition, people counting, or even fingerprint recognition. So you can see that the applications are vast and numerous, and really just limited by one's imagination and the processing resources required. That makes sense. Now, the term machine learning is so broad. I hear that term used with artificial intelligence, of course. But Dan, what exactly is machine learning? Yeah, 
I get that question. Let, let me take you through some basics about machine learning to, to explain it. In the context of embedded processors with fixed resources like RAM and flash, machine learning should just be thought of as a sophisticated method of pattern matching. For instance, detecting a word, like someone speaking Alexa or on or off. It's not the intelligence to recognize the meaning of a sentence or detecting an image like a cat or a horse or a road marker. It's not the instruction to navigate or detecting an anomaly like an unusual squeak or hum, not a prediction of a part failure. This sophisticated method uses a concept called deep learning or neural networks. And basically this method operates like a brain, but this brain must be trained to detect those patterns of interest for a particular application. This application specific trained brain is commonly referred to as a model. The de facto standard machine learning platform for running on embedded devices is TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. It was developed at Google as an optimization for the widely used TensorFlow platform that is used for cloud-based artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. So to finish this little introduction, I just want to introduce two terms. One is training. Training is the act of creating a model. When using machine learning technology for a particular application, a developer needs to create, develop, or train a model. The other term is inference. This is when a model is deployed in the field and it runs analyzing the real world data it's observing. This is the act of making a prediction about the sensor data being interpreted. So the important takeaway is that a machine learning model is an application specific, intelligent pattern matching algorithm. It has to be generated very precisely and purposefully for each application. Okay, so Dan, if I wanted to add machine learning to my next design, how would I go about doing that? Let me get into some of the nuts and bolts of creating an application. For embedded devices, there are typically two separate workflows. One is the traditional workflow used to create standard embedded applications. There would be a tool chain based on a developer's favorite IDE, and the output would be a binary file that's loaded on the embedded device to run in the field, as shown in this diagram. But what you have with machine learning is a completely separate workflow on its own. And what you want is to add machine learning as a value-added feature to an existing embedded application. I call this machine learning as a feature. In the world of connected embedded devices, People are looking to enhance their offering by adding machine learning technology to their existing products. And just to clarify the terms from the previous slide, training occurs during the development phase and inference occurs in the deployed product. Now let's look at the machine learning workflow in more detail. There are several distinct and common steps that are needed when developing a machine learning model for a target application. The first step, is to create a data set. This is the data that represents the patterns of interest for that application. The second step is to train the model. This is the step of creating that application specific intelligent pattern matching algorithm and is done with the data set as the input. Once the model is created, the developer goes into a phase of testing the model. It's an iterative process of finding the right level of accuracy to predict what's being observed. Since model training occurs on a PC or server, the model is converted into an optimized format to fit on an embedded device with limited resources like RAM. This process is typically an iterative process, which might go all the way back to supplementing the data set to incorporate more real-world insights. That makes sense. Now, Dan, if the workflow is that simple, is there just one machine learning tool out there to use? We wish, but no. There are so many tools out there and even different machine learning algorithms beyond deep learning neural networks that we talked about. Developers have a challenge to understand what's available out in the market and the selections are diverse, they're broad and plentiful. A key challenge with machine learning is how do I pick a tool? We've seen this as a semiconductor manufacturer and have tried to make sense of it by segmenting along two separate criteria, the machine learning skills required to use the tool and the use cases required by the application. 
developers have different skill levels, different application requirements, and even different business needs. And what's important is that the developer is able to pick the tool that's best suited for their needs. Okay, Dan, tell me more. How do you define the machine learning skills required to use a tool? So we split the machine learning skills into three categories to make it a little easier to understand. Expert, explorer, and solutions. For Silicon Lab products, we define a machine learning expert as a developer that's experienced with TensorFlow and Python. The expert tools require that the developer have these skills or is willing to learn. On the other side of the spectrum, we call it the machine learning solutions developer. This developer wants to use machine learning technology to add value to their product, but does not have any knowledge about machine learning or is willing to learn. Instead, they want a black box solution they add as a value-added feature to their product. In the middle, we call it the machine learning explorer. The skills expected here are to know the basic machine learning concepts and workflow, like we just discussed, but with a curated approach that steps the developer through all the steps needed to implement machine learning as a feature in their product. By segmenting tools into these simple categories, this allows a developer to understand what skills are expected of them in order to use the tool effectively. You can still have someone who qualifies as an expert use a solutions tool. This categorization just helps the developer understand what's expected of them. That makes sense. So how do you define use cases? For this, we use the application segmentation I described at the beginning of this presentation. And if you recall, there were four categories. There's the low data rate sensors. These are use cases based on accelerometers, temperature sensors, and the like to support applications like anomaly detection. There's audio pattern matching. This is the use of a microphone to detect any kind of non-speech sound. There's the voice commands using the same microphone but detecting spoken words. And then there's vision. We focus on the topic of image classification and object detection using low-resolution cameras. In all of these use cases, the output is the same. Was some pattern detected? And does it classify as an event worth acting upon? Okay, so how do you put this in practice? Here's how the two views are combined. We use a table that I'll populate with some of the machine learning tools we support on our chips. What you'll see is how the different tools are applicable to their appropriate use cases, as well as the machine learning skills needed to use the tool. For low rate sensors, there is TensorFlow for the expert, and there are Explorer tools that support those use cases. For audio pattern matching, you'll notice that micro AI is not on the list, but the Silicon Labs machine learning toolkit is. For voice commands, you'll notice that sensory is added as a solution provider where no machine learning knowledge is required. And finally, for low-resolution vision, not only TensorFlow is available for the expert, but Edge Impulse has some sophisticated object detection modules in their Explorer tool. Okay, so Dan, is that the only challenge for machine learning developers, finding an appropriate tool? There are other big challenges that face a machine learning developer for tiny ML devices. Let's start with the machine learning workflow we covered earlier and see how these challenges line up. First, and probably one of the most significant challenges, is to create a high-quality data set that is used for training that application-specific model. The data set used here will be directly related to the quality of the model running its inference in the field. I can't stress this enough that developers need to treat this as one of the most important aspects of creating a model. In fact, just recently, Pete Warden, who's probably considered the father of TinyML, or machine learning at the tiny edge, just posted his thoughts on his blog about how important the data set is. Treat your data like source code. The next challenge takes a while to fully understand and embrace. This one has to do with the mechanics of training a model versus running inference in the field. Basically, the training is done on a PC or server farm, and the inference is done on the embedded device. This isn't obvious, but the pre-processing, or we call a feature extraction that takes the data and prepares it for the neural network processing, has to be exactly the same between the PC and the embedded device. This is a common problem developers run into when they find their trained model is not performing as expected on the embedded device. Running inference with a model produces a prediction, 
And that data set used at the beginning determines how well that prediction will work. This cycle of testing is important and should be iterative. Create a model, deploy it, test it, refine it. Make sure your tool can support iterative development and versioning. And finally, there is a balance between the accuracy of a model and how big it is. The more accurate the model, the bigger the model. But within an embedded device, there's limited resources that can be dedicated to machine learning. Therefore, it's an important challenge to find the right balance between model performance and model fit. That's cool, Dan. Can you give us an example of this in the real world? I'd love to explain a really good example of how machine learning could be used at the tiny edge. Consider a door lock. We see smart door locks on the market now, ones that are connected with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and can be opened up from an app or even a voice assistant. However, what about the idea of adding value by adding an acoustically aware door lock? What would this look like? A smart acoustic door lock would be one with a mic and could be listening for different types of sounds. And if desired, those sounds could be notification events that are sent to the owner. For instance, it could listen for a knock on the door or a successful insertion of a key, or it could be detecting events of concern like the tampering of the lock or pounding on the door or glass breaking or some attempt to break in. And finally, it could go as far as voice identification to provide a second level of security. In fact, one of our third-party Explorer tool partners, Sensimal, has created a tutorial that goes through the step-by-step process of gathering data, training a model, testing, converting and integrating that model into a standard wireless application. This is just one of many ways that machine learning can provide added value. Cool. Well, how would I get started? First thing is to create your proof of concept with our recently introduced XG24 dev kit. We've made this dev kit very applicable for machine learning applications. It includes the MG24 wireless SOC with the integrated AIML hardware accelerator, plus a host of different sensors for all kinds of tiny ML applications. You create your basic wireless application like Bluetooth or Zigbee door lock, then explore the scilabs.com machine learning landing page to find out what tool is most applicable for your needs. In the example I just talked about, you may want to pick Sensimal because of their closely related tutorial on a smart acoustic door lock. All of these machine learning tools support ML as a feature, so you can choose the one that fits your skills and your application needs. Once you've created and integrated your machine learning model into your application, you can test and deploy your proof of concept for some real world testing. All right. Well, Dan, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? I'd love to. So just to summarize with some things to remember about the benefits Silicon Labs brings to machine learning. We have the widest portfolio of wireless protocols that can be combined with machine learning for tiny ML devices. We have the first wireless SOC with an integrated hardware accelerator enabling low energy applications with machine learning. We have a wide range of tools that fit the needs of the developer. And finally, we support a diverse set of use cases, including low rate sensors, audio, voice, and low resolution vision. We provide an end-to-end machine learning solution for wireless IoT tiny edge devices. Well, Dan, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia, for having me, and I enjoyed it very much. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Silicon Labs. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or check out YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.